Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you have been with us before, you know that we've been making a quick trip through the Bible, book by book. And we're going to begin the study of the book of Hebrews uh, this session. And so open your Bible to the first chapter of Hebrews, and let's start with the very first verse. We'll read a couple of them. Okay, God, who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In a book that is written primarily to the Hebrews, mm -hmm. why would he introduce it this way? Good question. Now you remember that the Hebrews believed that being descendants of Abraham, they had an inside track to salvation. In <coughs> fact, they believed that if you were descended from Abraham, you really didn't have to do anything. You were sort of born on the bus and you would automatically make it to the kingdom unless you did something really bad. And God knew when he inspired Paul to write this book. And by the way, there's pretty good evidence that this book was written during the final days of Paul's imprison first imprisonment in Rome, where he had time to sit. This isn't a regular letter, as his other letters are. Uh, we don't know absolutely for certain that Paul wrote it, except that there's the compelling evidence that was that Paul actually wrote it, both from the ancient fathers uh, if you go back and look at that, all the early fathers said, no, this came from Paul. It isn't until a couple hundred years afterwards that they started doubting that Paul was the author. And they doubted that for a couple of reasons. Let me just go over those real quick. <clears throat> One is that Paul's letters that he wrote, he wrote while he was busy traveling and working and so forth like this. And he, he, he writes as a person who's just anxious to get on, and he's, he's, he's jumping around, and he's making detours in his speech and so forth. And this is, a, this is a, more, a little more quiet, polished, carefully presented uh, 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 document. And so it was written by Paul, while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, almost certainly. Was the original one in Hebrew? Well, that's one of the questions. When they started questioning about whether or not Paul wrote it, they, wrote, they questioned it because of the very polished Greek and because of the careful layout of the plans. And some people said, well, maybe it, the, the theology sounds like Paul. Virtually nobody agrees with, disagrees with that. The theology sounds like Paul, but the, the language doesn't sound like Paul to some people. And so some had suggested that Paul maybe wrote the original in Hebrew, since he was writing to Hebrews, and that maybe Dr. Luke translated it into Greek. Um, if that's true, and most people doubt that, scholars really doubt that, because there are a number of plays on the Greek words in the, in the book. So if, if Paul wrote it in Hebrew and Luke translated it, he, he did some fairly fancy changes in, in, to make the plays on words. There's quite a few plays on words here that only work in Greek. They don't work in Hebrew at all. Furthermore, nobody's ever found any Hebrew document, Hebrew or Aramaic, of this book. They're all in, the earliest documents are all in Greek. And sorry to interrupt you, and yeah. Paul was also proficient in Greek. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, he grew up in a Greek city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, not, in, not in Greece, but a Greek-speaking city. Um, he probably had Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek at least. Yes. And that's why he said, I speak more languages than all, all of you. Or, yeah, well, and, Greek, and remember that having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, he probably spoke a whole bunch of languages. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> Paul here, I think under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, you Hebrews, are about to go to undergo a, 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 a lightning strike or a terrible thing going to happen to you because within a few years after this book was written, 
Judea was attacked, Jerusalem was completely destroyed, the temple was, the, te the stones of the temple were not, one was left upon another, the whole place was just completely in shambles. And if you believe that, remember that God had told them that the only place you can offer your sacrifices is at this one spot in Jerusalem. Now, there's no place to offer your sacrifices. And if you believe that your salvation is based on, one, your descent from Abraham, and two, your offering of sacrifice in the mm -hmm. temple, what's left? So in the, in the Jewish society, you're actually forbidden from doing any type of uh, sacrifice mm -hmm. except at the temple. That's correct. And That's today the there is no building temple. That's right. Because on that mountain where the, the Solomon's temple and then later Herod's temple stood, on that spot is now a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock. And if you happen to visit Jerusalem and you, you, you choose to walk up from the, from the Western Wall where the, where the Hebrews are, or the Jews are, are celebrating and, and, and worshiping, you just walk up a little tiny little narrow path up to the Dome of the Rock. It will say up there, no Jew is allowed beyond this point of da 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 on a sign over the, over the path as you go up. So yeah, it's, uh, that's a, uh, you know, there's a very definite line there. There's no, no question about that. There's no Jews going to be allowed up there to, to worship. Um, so that providence has probably kept them from sacrificing again, since they're not... For sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And 2,000 years later, it's still like that. Mm -hmm. And if you ask a Jew why they don't offer sacrifices based on the Old Testament, because of course they don't accept the New Testament, that's what they'll tell you. We're allowed to offer sacrifices only on that one spot, and that one spot has a Muslim mosque on it. So, but anyway, so Paul says, the message of this book, at least at the initial part, and we'll, we'll see if you agree with me by the time we get to the end, the message of this book is, my fellow Hebrews, my fellow Jews, we don't have to have a temple in Jerusalem to hold our religion together. What we have is the inspired Word of God. What we have is the Bible. And in those days, it was primarily the Old Testament. And, and we Christian Jews now have something that surpasses that. And that, of course, is, is the Christian teaching. We have Jesus Christ who came and so forth. So he starts out, and as Norm already did for us, uh, in the way, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us through His Son. Now, you know, if, if God speaks to a prophet and then He speaks to His Son, which, which is more important? The Son. It's per son. pretty obvious, like, right? He is the one through whom God created the universe. How about that? The one whom God has chosen to possess all things in the end. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and his exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe with his powerful word. So here's one of the questions that we're going to, we're going to struggle with in, in the book of Hebrews. Can a God, because at the end it's going to say our God is a consuming fire. Could a God who is all-powerful, so much so that he literally can speak and reverse a nuclear reaction. He can go from energy to matter. We can only go from matter to energy, and we, we're scared to death of that for obvious reasons. God can take energy, he can make it into matter. That God was born as a tiny baby boy. Now think about that. I mean, the God who sits on a throne in heaven and, and there's fire all over the place and there's, you know, whatever, you know, and he's, our God is a consuming fire. How do we put those pieces together? That's the challenge of the book of Hebrews. Well, not only the book of Hebrews, yeah. but that is, that is the challenge until the second coming of Christ and then on throughout eternity. Yeah. Because how can created understand creator? Mm -hmm. Well, that's And unless you can, you, you, you can't understand that. Yeah. That, that's basically the study of the Trinity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, that's, that's the part question of, that's you're getting into. It, yes. um, and one of the questions it raises, and I don't, we don't have time to do, to do this in detail right now, but there are friends, we have Christ, so-called Christian friends who believe in, who are, um, who believe that only the Father is truly God and that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are, are, are at a lower level. And... Um, they would say that we shouldn't worship Jesus, we should only worship the Father because he is, he is the one who's truly God. 
the problem, and, and they base that on, or they could base that if they chose to, is on Romans 1, where it says you shouldn't worship a created being. Exactly. But you go back to Hebrews now and look at verse uh, 5 and 6. For God never said to any of his angels, they would, those would be the created beings, mm -hmm. you are my son, today I have become your father. Nor did God say about any angel, I will be his father and he will be my son. But when God was about to send his firstborn son into the world, he said, all of God's angels must worship him. And also, what is that saying? And also in Revelations, it yes. says several times, <coughs> worship him who created heaven yes. and earth. Exactly. And right here, we just read uh, that, um, that he had done that through mm -hmm. Jesus, mm -hmm. yeah. whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Exactly. And mm -hmm. many other places. So, but this would, would say he's a notch above angels, Way above but, angels, but doesn't say he's equal with God. Well, but if you go, to, if if you go wrong, to John, you can. Well, you can do that, but, but the, be, the better argument, because if you go to John, they're going to they're gonna use their version of translation that says the word was a God and so forth like that. And they're gonna, they they, they, they yeah, doctored that, that verse. Egypt but if, type, type of Greek. But if, you, but if you go to Romans 1 and you say, do you believe that we should worship Jesus? No, we shouldn't worship Jesus. He's not equal with the Father. Okay, that's what Romans 1 says. You should not worship a created being. Okay, we all agree on that. Okay, then you come to Hebrews 1 and you say, God himself says to worship the Son. Okay, now what do you say? If it's wrong to, create a, to worship a created being and God says to worship the Son, what is he saying? He's, He's not, not a created, created being. Not a created being. He's not a created being. He's a creator, and that's exactly what we read in Romans one. I mean, I'm sorry, Hebrews one. Then he goes on to talk in, in, in chapter two about the great salvation, and he he talks about how, well through one and two how Christ is superior to to angels um, in every way. But that's not the end of his discussion. Um, if we, we come to chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, we find something interesting. Remember, we're, we're making a fairly quick trip through here. Look at, um, well, let's start with verse 14. Chapter 2, starting with verse 14. Since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. So who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus becoming like who? Humans. Like us, yeah. right? Like us as right. human beings. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death and in this way set free those who were slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. For it is clear that it is not the angels that he helps, instead he helps the descendants of Abraham. This means that he had to become like his people in every way in order to be their faithful and merciful high priest in his service to God so that the people's sins would be forgiven. And now he could help those who are tempted because he himself was tempted and suffered. So, the question is, can Jesus do some things that the Father can't do? Because the Father hasn't been down here, he hasn't been tempted, he hasn't been tried, etc. No, he's doing the exact opposite. He's showing us the Father. Showing us the Father through our understanding, our ways of, of seeing. Um, how can the Father show himself without doing that? But this seems to suggest that, that he understands us better. He can help us. He can help those who are tempted. Because and, he himself was tempted. And that, in that he understands us better since he has been down here, then he didn't understand us as well before he came down here. Well, you need to put together with it, with that passage, the one in chapter 4. Look at this one, starting with verse 14. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we have a great high priest. What's the function of a priest? Mediator, communicate. Yeah. He's, he, between a parties. priest is supposed to stand between God and his people, right? Who has gone into the very presence of God. That's what he needs to do, right? Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. That means the Father can't feel sympathy with our weaknesses? Yeah. I think he's trying to communicate. He sent, he sent Jesus down here because of our weaknesses. 
So he couldn't understand. So he sent Jesus down. He says, because he understood. Because he understood. In the wrong way. Uh, it's because we don't understand. Okay, well, let me I think on. I think that's what it is. I mean, how do we know that he doesn't understand unless we don't understand? So God is trying to make it easier for us, letting us see mm -hmm. himself. Well, to give, him, give us something like to ourselves. see. Yeah, mm -hmm. because we can relate to it. It's not that he's relating to us better. It's that we're relating to him better. Mm-hmm. Okay, on the contrary, I, go, I read on, on the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then, and approach God's throne where there is grace. There, there we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. In other words, now we can have confidence in approaching God's throne, because we didn't before, but now we can have confidence because Jesus is there pleading on our behalf. Because now we can see him which tells us more about God. Now we have confidence we can do it. Okay, you don't like my playing the devil's advocate? <laughs> <laughs> well, what about that? Do we need a, a priest between us and God? Yes. Why? Because... Where, where did that idea first come from? Well, <clears throat> the universe. Think about a God that can actually control the universe. How can you even conceive of a God that way unless he, he put, presents himself in a way that we can conceive him? The very first time in Scripture where any, there's any talk about someone going in between, you know, where people didn't directly relate to God without any problem, is found at the end of the, end of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And let's look at that. It's Exodus 20, verses 18, 19, and 20. When the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast, this is the giving of the Ten Commandments, and saw the lightning and the smoking mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. Okay? They said to Moses, If you speak to us, we will listen, but we are afraid that if God speaks to us, we will die. Moses replied, Don't be afraid. God has only come to test you and make you keep on obeying him so that you will not sin. But the people continued to stand a long way off and only Moses went near the dark cloud where God was. So who was it that's asking for an intercessor? The people. The people. God didn't ask for an intercessor. Wait, didn't God put a rope around the... the High priest. Um, no. No, he put a rope around the mountain so, and told them not to go any further than that. Uh, they, he put a fence and he told them not to. Well, that, that has significance to what you're saying there. Okay, what, what's the significance? The significance is that... Um, they were told. How can I, how can I say this? <laughs> this I mean, there's, there's a point that humans can go, can only go before... They're consumed. Okay, so, okay, but remember, the purpose of this whole discussion is, what does this say to us about God? So what does it say to you about God that he comes down on the top of a mountain, he shakes the mountain, there's black clouds, there's thunder, there's lightning, there's a loud voice, there's trumpets, and everybody is scared to death. But isn't that symbolizing what I just said about the God of the universe? That he's so big that, that who can even perceive him? Who can even okay. come close to him without even angels? How in the world are they going to come close to this God? Um, in that state. Okay, and who was that God on the top of the mountain? Who was Gentle the God? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Well, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So yeah. you're still saying the same thing. Actually, in one place, Ellen White says that the Father came down with the Son on the mountain. But it's, uh, it's that's primarily... That's symbolic, though. Yeah, it's primarily Jesus who came down. And where, how, do we, how do we know that? 1 Corinthians 10 just says so in so many words. 1 Corinthians 10, one, especially verse 4, 1 to 4, if you want to read that. Um, anyway, we've got a lot more things to cover in Hebrews. What is the Sabbath-like rest that it talks about in chapter 4? Well, it, uh, Ken, it clearly, clearly <laughs> spells out what that means. And I think that Paul was getting to it gently Bible, in the first <laughs> chapter, in the second chapter, in the third chapter. Mm -hmm. Very gently, that was the subject, and people may not catch that there. And then in the fourth chapter, he got stronger about it until he came to 
uh, the point where he said in verse 7 of chapter 4, Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The first three chapters was all about hardening their hearts. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Mm -hmm. And then verse 9, it clearly says, There remains then a Sabbath rest. Here's, here's the catch right here. Mm -hmm. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also enters from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, we're talking about the Sabbath here, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. And in the first three chapters, that's all it talked about was their hardened hearts, their disobedience, not entering the rest. Okay, well, the first three chapters, of course, talks about God's position and his, how, how glorious Jesus was and so forth, yes. by, in contrast to what you're talking about. What, what are we specifically saying when we say rest? What are well, we saying? Good question. What was God's original plan for the children of Israel? Do we know what it was? It, it would be a theocracy. Okay. And that they would obey and they would learn to love and he would bless and they would have no diseases. The world would come to them because of their blessings and say, how does it happen to you? And they were to be the light of the world. Yes. And they were supposed to go out in time spreading the gospel through the whole world. Yeah. That's what was supposed to happen. Did it happen? Nope. Not at all. In fact, what did they do? They started adopting the, the false religious practices and all the pagan ideas of the people that they didn't drive out even from Palestine. Right. The ones they were not, weren't even supposed to be there. God says, get rid of these people completely, either drive them out or destroy them. And what did they do? They adopted their religious practices. That's what happened. So they didn't enter the rest. So what needs to happen for us to enter the rest? <sighs> Whether you're sound asleep or you're really resting mentally, it means that you've given up the cares of the moment. Mm -hmm. you, they're not bothering you. You're not turning them over and over and over. You have come to complete rest and enjoyment. And that's exactly what, what Jesus invited Adam and Eve to on the seventh day of creation was to just sit down relax and enjoy our company, enjoy what we've made. That's exactly what he's asking for us to do now. Mm -hmm. Give up on self, give up on trying to drive your way to the top of something in your own strength. Just let me take care of it for you. Mm -hmm. You enter into the rest that you were supposed to have a long time ago, and I'll still take care of it for you. And God says in this chapter, that rest is still available for people who trust him. That's right. And, and that's that thing, we, that thing that trust, we call faith, isn't it? Yeah, trust, faith, confidence, belief, those are all the same word in Greek. There's just one word in Greek. The Greek word is pistis, as we, as we know. So, so trust is rest? Mm -hmm. Trust? Well, trust leads to rest. It's not the same as rest. It leads to rest. Trust in the Lord. Yeah. So we don't have to fear because we trust in the Lord. Uh, but when, when does that happen? I mean, if well, trust, if, if, um, if you're talking about faith, which happens all the time, uh, and then you have rest that comes from faith, well, when exactly does that happen? Does it happen all the time? Well, suppose that you were talking to our author. We believe it was Paul. He's in prison, sitting there, chained to a Roman soldier. Would you say he had peace? He had rest. Um, mm. Well, I'm having a little trouble <coughs> still with my definition of rest, so, <laughs> so I'm kind of... <laughs> well, so think about this. Paul is saying, what matters to me is, is not the chain around my arm. 
What matters to me is my total and complete confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And that's what matters. Total and complete confidence. He says, you can cut my head off tomorrow. In fact, in... Which is independent of yeah. circumstances. Yes. Independent of circumstances. I may be in the worst possible circumstances. I may be marching out to have my head chopped off, but I have full confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ because I know that the next moment, what am I going to see? I'm going to see him coming in the clouds. So, so you, by your definition, you would say that Christ carrying his cross to crucifixion, he was resting during that time, mm -hmm. right? Technically speaking. And, and it doesn't and, seem like a good rest to me. Well, but what did he say? <laughs> At the very end, just before he died, what did he say? Into he thy hands. Into thy hands, I commit my spirit. I commit my spirit. Okay, that means complete trust. He says, God, I'm giving up. As a human being, there's nothing more I can do. I mean, here I am nailed to the cross. There's nothing more I can do to represent you to these people. I'm giving up, but I put my total confidence. And if you read the book, uh, Desire of Ages, read the chapter on, on Calvary, she really emphasizes that. She says he can't see through the portals of the tomb. He can't actually see for sure whether he's going to be raised from the dead. But he turns to his father and he says, Father, I'm placing it all in your hands. I have complete confidence in you. It's a demonstration of faith, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, the rest is connected well, to let, that. Let me give you saying. another illustration. Uh, we've talked about this a lot of times. I don't want to spend a long time <clears> on it, but <throat> think about Peter. There he is at the trial of Jesus, and the maid points her finger at him. He says, no, I don't know this man, Jesus. Let me cuss and swear to tell you that I don't know Jesus. Okay? <clears throat> Six weeks later, seven weeks later, when he's, when he's arrested and brought before the Jewish leader, but brought before the Sanhedrin, which would be the equivalent of our Congress, the leaders of the nation, he says, if you want to know who performed this miracle that raised this man from, from his crippled state, so he's walking around, and there he is standing here, perfectly whole, healthy, and so forth, it was done in the name of Jesus, and Jesus is the one that you crucified, and he is the Messiah. I mean, there is no fear. So, no fear here left at all. So Peter did not take the fifth. No, he didn't take he, the fifth. He testified, Jesus is the one. Yeah. So is peace, that, peace and rest the same word as far as the meaning goes? No, but they're close. It, it's hard to go to sleep if you're not at rest, not at peace. Well, that's what I'm asking. Is it the mm. same? Not exactly, but it's close. Okay. Let's move on. The next big thing we come to, and we're going to have to take a break here in just a moment. The next big thing we come to in the book of, of Hebrews is Melchizedek. What do we know about Melchizedek? Not much. <laughs> Let's just look at a couple of verses. Let's start way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. We'll have a chance just to read a couple of verses here, and then we'll take a break. Genesis chapter 14, and I'm reading from starting with verse 17. Uh, when Abraham came back from his victory over Kedileomer and the other kings, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in Shava Valley, also called King's Valley. And Melchizedek, who was king of Salem and also a priest of the Most High God, brought bread and wine to Abraham. And as you read the story on, he did what? He offered him a tithe. Why were God's chosen people offering tithe to an un-Jewish leader of some kind. Don't go away, we'll be back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. I hope that you've had some questions in your mind as you read through the book of Hebrews in the past about this Melchizedek guy. What do we know about him? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, the name Melchizedek means the, the king of righteousness. Melchi is the Greek, I mean, Hebrew word for king. Zedek is the Hebrew word for righteousness. So uh, there we are the king of righteousness, and he's also called the king of Salem. What is the king of Salem? What, what's he talking about there? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah, exactly. So this man, where did he come from? Don't know. The answer is we don't know. We don't know. And who were his children? Where did they go? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> That's the right answer. Why is Paul talking about this guy who's popped out of nowhere and disappears into ancient history and we know virtually nothing about him? Was there really a Salem then? Oh, well, that was the ancient name for Jerusalem. Yeah. <coughs> so he was but the king of Jerusalem. No. He was the king of Jerusalem. Well, it was a small Paul, fiefdom, if you will. Paul wants to get people to believe in somebody that doesn't have a Jewish ancestry. And How does he do that? Well, he's doing it here by making a parallel or a type out of Melchizedek, mm -hmm. to whom Abraham, their patriarch, mm -hmm. gave tithe and, and honored. Mm -hmm. So what was the relationship of Abraham to Levi and Aaron and so forth? Grandfather. Great grandfather. Great grandfather. And so forth down the line. So in the Hebrew mind, who's greater, the great grandfather or the great grandson? The great grandfather. Of course. You know, you must respect your elders, right? So Paul is doing something very clever here. Very, very clever. Here are these Jewish people that are holding tight onto these, you know, you had to prove with be, beyond any reasonable doubt that you were a descendant of Aaron, you were a descendant of Levi, or you couldn't participate in the, in the temple services, I mean, as far as actually being a priest and so forth like this. And God knows, maybe Paul, I don't know whether he told Paul, but uh, God knows that that whole thing was about to fall apart, to be totally destroyed. And then where's your confidence going to go? Well, Paul is saying, you know, we don't have to have a lineage to be God's people. We don't even have to have a priest who has a lineage to be God's people. We can approach God directly. Did Jesus ever tell us that we could approach him directly? Approach God directly? Did Jesus yeah. ever tell us that? Yeah. Yes. Where? You can, you can show us well. <laughs> yeah, I will. In the last night that Jesus spent with his disciples, which is discussed in detail from John 13 through 17, uh, he says in John 16, right in the middle of that, some very interesting verses that almost no one has clearly seemed to understand and, and believed. Let me read those. John 16, verse 25. This is Jesus. This is God himself, the one we're talking about here in Hebrews. The, you know, the, the one who created the universe, and this is what he's saying. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, if we had Jesus standing here among us, on, on, and we could see him on the TV camera, and he said, please, I have something really important to tell you about my Father, would we pay attention? Would we care? I mean, that ought to be the most important thing he has to say in his whole life almost, right? I have something to tell you plainly about my father. So what's he going to say? Well, when that day comes, whenever I'm going to tell you plainly, we'll see when that might be, you will ask him in my name and I do not. And I'm, I'm guessing that every one of you has a not there, but most people don't believe the not is there. That, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Jesus just did away with the whole Old Testament sacrificial system, didn't he? 
Yes, and that's the tie-in to Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, because it says time for a new change, a new system. Mm -hmm. But you see, that, if those, when, when Jerusalem was destroyed and they had no temple and they had that, if they could come to that understanding, all of those worries and frustrations about no place to sacrifice, coming to this idea would be a rest mm -hmm. that they could enjoy. Yeah, exactly. I just want to point an uh, idea. The first who talked about Melchizedek was Moses, mm -hmm. who wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And he wrote so nice and was full of respect for this person. Yes. Impress many generations, including Paul. Mm -hmm. And from that respect and uh, that uh, nice uh, attitude for a, a person who is not in linkage with any anything, uh, gave us an idea of a symbol of mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's interesting that uh, Moses also inspired uh, one of the psalmists. And I was just looking to see whether um, it says specifically who it might have been. Uh, a, what does it say here? It does, oh, a psalm by David, it says. Now, not all of these uh, little uh, attributions at, uh, at the, under the titles of these different uh, chapters these in, in the book of Psalms are 100%. They were not a part of the very earliest documents, but they are very ancient. So we're going to assume that Psalm 119 is... Um, I'm sorry, Psalm 110 was from, um, was from David. David. And he's writing a psalm here about the ascension of a new king to the throne of David. And notice what he says in verse 4. The Lord made a solemn promise and will not take it back. You will be a priest forever. Now, look at this carefully. Who's he talking to and about? To and about in my opinion here, Jesus. In okay. verse 1, it's speaking yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Well, yeah. The Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right, so Lord, Lord, if you notice, is in caps, that's Yahweh. Yahweh. God says, to my Lord, and that's not caps. What does that mean? He's not speaking to Jesus. Who's he speaking to? King. He's talking to the future king who's a, supposed to be his. This psalm is about a new king coming to the throne. Okay? And he says, you will be a priest forever. And of course, he's, this is a symbol of Jesus to come. Yeah, I'm not arguing with that part. But he's talking about a human here. A human being who comes from the tribe of Judah to be what? A priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. What? person from the tribe of Judah ends up being a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. That Jesus. Mean, uh, when uh, Jesus questioned yeah. the Pharisees, mm -hmm. pointing to this psalm, exactly. including the priesthood of Melchizedek, mm -hmm. referring to himself. Yes, exactly. So Paul takes his cue from Jesus. Jesus himself is the one who, who used this idea. He says, Someday, there's going to be someone who comes from the tribe of Judah to be king and priest forever. I wonder who that could be. Hmm. <laughs> you know? He, he, and he left it a question. He didn't, he didn't say specifically, it's me. He just, he left it with a question, didn't he? Jesus did. Okay, now, Paul... So he, he said a new king. Mm -hmm. So what's the significance of the new king? Well, the point is here, here's someone from the tribe of Judah who is in the royal line, so he's, he's eligible to be a king. Mm -hmm. But he's not only going to be a king, he's going to be a what? Priest. A priest forever. And he's not in that royal line. And he's not in the priestly line. Of the Levites. Of the Levites. You can't be a, a descendant of Judah and a descendant of Levi at the same time. Mm -hmm. So in other words, he's, just, he's breaking up this system of bloodlines. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. In other words, you don't have to be in some fancy bloodline to be saved or to accept salvation or whatever. Or to be a priest. Or to be even a priest. 
Well, Paul goes on, and what does he say? What, what, what is in conclusion about? Well, l let's just look at some of that. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. Every high priest is chosen from his fellow men and appointed to serve God on their behalf to offer sacrifice and offerings for sins. Since he himself is weak in many ways, he is able to be gentle with those who are ignorant and make mistakes. And because he himself is weak, he must offer sacrifices not only for the sins of the people, but also for his own sins. Now, did they, did they know all about that? Yeah. They knew about that from the, from the ceremonies on the Day of Atonement, right? Very clearly. It was all spelled out. No one chooses for himself the honor of being a high priest. It is only by God's call that a man is made a high priest, just as Aaron was. Okay? So he's spelling that out. In the same way, Christ did not take upon himself the honor of being a high priest. He couldn't because he was a descendant of Judah, right? Instead, God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. He also said in another place, you will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. And he quotes straight from Psalms. So here we have the king-priest coming together, right? But look what he says next. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God who could save him from death. Because he was humble and devoted, God heard him. But even though he was God's son, he learned through his sufferings to be obedient. We're going, to talk, we're going to come back and talk about that. But maybe we better do that right now. We keep saying, oh no, Jesus was equal with the Father. How did he learn to be obedient? To suffering. He put that equal with the Father aside. Um, and he came here as a human. And humans need to learn to be obedient. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and ob if obedience means comes from the Greek word what? Hupakoe, a listening Hupakoe, under. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which humble, means, ob, humble willingness to listen. So you, but you don't listen, or you don't trust the person you're listening until you've learned that the tr person is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So it takes some time. Mm -hmm. Now with Jesus, I don't think it took maybe as much time as it takes myself, for example. Mm -hmm. but, but as uh, a representative of humanity who was in battle with Satan, mm -hmm. Satan said humanity can't obey. Mm -hmm. Right. And in his humanity, Jesus was in this battle with Satan, representing us. And he won that by obedience, which he now, when we take to him by faith, we get to take advantage of his obedience. As I remember reading through the Gospels, it's constantly saying Jesus is talking to the Father, praying to the Father, coming to the Father. And he's getting instructions from the Father. Right. He knows he can trust the Father. The Father's not going to let him down, so he, it goes from there. L let, me, let me read you a few sentences from the pen of Ellen White, from different sources, mostly from Desire of Ages. <clears throat> this is mostly from Desire of Ages, pages approximately 70 through um, up to 78, actually. I'm just pick a few pick a few sentences. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. Mary, as a human being, is teaching God about heavenly things. Think about that. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. That's Desire of Ages, page 70. Dro uh, dropping down to another spot. Thus to Jesus, the significance of the word and works of God was unfolded as he was trying to understand the reason of things. Heavenly beings were his attendants, and the culture of holy thoughts and communings was his. So not only Mary was teaching him, who else was teaching him? Angels. Angels. Dropping down now, page 78. But Jesus in the temple, now this is at age 12, had been taught by God. That which he had received, he began at once to impart. So God also was one of his instructors. Now, you, every, you, might, you might say, well, obviously, it's clearly he had a huge advantage over us. There's no way we can do that. Except that the next sentence says, or a little elsewhere in another part of that same chapter, every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. What does that say? What prevents that? 
Yeah. I, if I might, I'd like to just read the one more line. Okay. The same sentence. Yeah. From the works of nature yeah. and the pages of God's holy word. Yeah. As we try to become acquainted with our Heavenly Father through His Word, angels will draw near, our minds will be strengthened, and our characters will be elevated and refined. Desire of Ages, page 70, uh, paragraph 4. In childhood, youth, and manhood, Jesus studied the Scriptures. As a little child, He was daily at His mother's knee, taught from the scrolls of the prophets. Now, one of the questions I have is, how did she have access to that? Those scrolls were very precious. You weren't allowed to touch them. You had to have a priest sort of unroll them for you and read them to you. But somehow or other, apparently, she'd either memorized them so she could share them with Jesus, or somehow she got access to those. Anyway, in his youth, the early morning, the evening twilight often found him alone on the mountainside or among the trees of the forest, spending a quiet hour in prayer and the study of God's Word. During his ministry, this is what Jim was talking about a little bit later, a little, little bit earlier. During his ministry, his intimate acquaintance with the scriptures testifies to his diligence in their study. And since he gained knowledge as we may gain it, notice that again, his wonderful power, both mental and spiritual, is a testimony <coughs> to the value of the Bible as a means of education. Now that one's in education, the book Education, page 185. Just a couple more sentences. Through the Holy Spirit, now this is talking about Mary, through the Holy Spirit she received wisdom to cooperate with the heavenly agencies in the development of this child who could claim only God as his father. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses, spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. And spread out before him was the great library of God's created works. He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. Heavenly beings were his attendants, and the culture of holy thoughts and communities was his. From the first dawning of intelligence, he was constantly growing in spiritual grace and knowledge of truth. Um, in answer to the question, why, don't, why can't we? All of that that you were talking about there was time that he spent with the Father, was time that he spent studying. Yep. Morning, during the day with his mother, and at night, he was spending hours in Bible study. Mm -hmm. We don't tend to do that today. And who loses? We lose. Well, you know, the, there is, um, we often hear and from the writings of Ellen White, if only the children of Israel had done this, if only they had done that, if only the disciples had done this, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> you find that from Genesis on up until today, um, does, that, does that mean it's really, po really possible to do all of that? Jesus did it to prove <clears throat> that it is possible as a human being. Unless well, I, you unless know, I, I like that and I kind of believe that, but sometimes, you know, somewhere along, the, some, somewhere along the line, I've, it seems like I've, I've also heard that, <clears throat> that, that, you know, we, we can see in the history of humans and how they've interacted with when things were set up with um, uh, the prophets, the prophetic, the, 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 I'm Ancient. sorry, the patriarch, the patriarch, patriarch system. Yeah. You know, it was all there, but somehow that system didn't work. And then, so you can, you can, you can come to see that relying on that kind of a system, it doesn't work. And then, well, we, now we have a nation. And we've started a nation, uh, the, the, the Hebrews and the Israelites, and it didn't work there either. We have priests and we have prophets. Right, and, and everything along the way, it, it, it seems like I've heard there's an illustration, I'm kind of wandering around here for the words because it's kind of a vague concept and I'm... I think I'm, it's I'm, just proof that <coughs> sin and sinners and selfishness can destroy any system. Well, but has any of these systems ever worked? No, because of sin and selfishness. And how does Paul conclude exactly what you've concluded? Look now at Hebrews 5, starting with verse 11. 
There is much we have to say about this matter. He says, he's just, he's just getting warmed up. He says, there's a lot more I'd like to tell you about how to become like Christ, about Melchizedek, about all that stuff. There is much we have to say about this matter, but it is hard to explain to you because you are so slow to understand. I wonder who he's talking to. There has been enough time for you to be teachers. And 2,000 years later, is there enough time for us to understand how much help, more help do we have? We have all those scrolls printed out in nice little books and language which we can read. And if we don't like this version, we can look at another version. We can look at another version. we got it on our computers. We can search it any way we want. I mean, how much more help does God need to give us? And he goes on to say, there's been enough time for you to be teachers, yet you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any, any experience in the matter of right and wrong. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. Boy, I, what would you do if your pastor stood up and preached you a sermon like that? But didn't even Paul, don't we understand that Paul's ministry was cut short because of faulty decisions that he made? All decisions that the church leaders made that cut Paul's life short. This is true. Well, what answer are we coming up here then? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, I'm going to give you an example here. I mean, I mean, we're talking about failure ever since time began, mm -hmm. ever since um, Eve took the apple. Mm -hmm. It seems like God set things up, and after a while, it just deteriorated down again. Mm -hmm. So and, so it, it looks like times? it's happening over and over and over again, but sometimes I wonder, can you really point to us and say, oh, it's our fault? <laughs> no, I'm not we pointing. could do any better. I'm not pointing to uh, us to say it's our fault. Well, I'm saying humanity. Yeah. Okay. I'm saying humanity. But the response would be, my response to that, and I think that this is based on Scripture, is someone at some point in time is going to have to do better, or we're never going to get to heaven. Well, maybe the Spirit needs to do better. Like to actually if come. If we were waiting for the like Holy did. Spirit, He would have done it right after Jesus died. Well, and it, Why it, would He wait? Wait, He did. He came, Pentecost. Yeah. Well, then it broke down again. Yes. So you got the Spirit putting all of everything my, into my it, and now exactly. it broke down again. So where's the breakdown? It's on our side. No, maybe God is just telling us that, that uh, righteousness and evil just will not coexist. Of course, of course. But and, and that's going to be that way until it's convinced by everybody. And that's maybe is, is going to be the basis for uh, the, the, putting down sin. There's it, something wrong with that because it worked for Enoch. He yeah, was, he was a human. He was a human. He, well, I I, he I'd be happy fell. to have it work that way for me. Yeah, but, but he didn't come. <laughs> he was pretty close to the, the well, time before. But what before. about Elijah? Elijah lived in the, one of the worst possible times. Elijah, what would that? He's always had it? the righteous people. Elijah was taken because he had a question. No, no, Elijah was taken because God could trust him to take him to heaven. No, I yes. think I think he was. He had a question, and the Lord says, "You're coming with me. I'm going to show you." Ugh. You, you go. What about Moses? I mean, these people tell us that it's possible for human beings, under very difficult circumstances, to live that kind of life. But I think they're they're. They didn't make it all the way. They're, they're going up to, to perform their minister to keep okay. performing it. Let's look, what the, look at what the Bible says. Let's look Is your that. message then, because it has never happened, it won't happen? What? No, well, I'm, because we keep doing it bad, we, we're going to continue. My message is that righteousness and evil cannot coexist. That's my message. So? so it's impossible for us to be righteous because they're certainly surrounded by evil. Well, that's true. That's true. I'm, I'm wondering if one of the lessons is somehow, and I don't know how to define it, is that, is that we've seen all the, all the uh, and we're running out of time here, where we've seen all, all of the ways that, that, you know, you could structure this, that one would think that it ought to work, but it doesn't. 
and maybe there's a lesson there in that. But at the same time, there it, things do work here. Okay, let me, let me tell you what the Bible says. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 18, I don't have time to read it, you're going to have to look at the first four verses. He says, you need to be like little children. What's important about little children? Trust. Fantastic listen. capacity to grow. That's what happened. That's what's important. To grow mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually. And we're really talking about the spiritual part. And how does Paul says, let us go forward then. Look at chapter 6, Hebrews 6. Let us go forward then to mature teaching and leave behind us the first lessons of the Christian message. Why are we stuck in the mud? That's what Paul is saying. We should not lay again the foundation of turning away from useless works and believing in God or the teaching about baptisms, the laying on of hands, or the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. There's nothing wrong with those, but he says, let's go forward. This is what the, we will do if God allows. And if we could put that together with Ephesians chapter 4, it says, it was God who gave gifts. I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It was he who gave gifts to the people. He pointed out to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, and others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. That would be the church. And so we shall all come together. That's what's going to happen when we get this right. We shall all come together um, uh, to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God, we shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be, be children, carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people, who lead others into error by their tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth of the spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head, and he goes on to explain that. That's what God is calling us to. He says we have to get out of this being stuck in the mud business. And we, we need to look to the example of Jesus, and that's exactly what Paul is calling for here in the book of Hebrews. He says, look to the example of Jesus. Grow up as he grew up, from the childhood to, to adulthood. It doesn't matter if your hairs are gray like mine. It doesn't matter if you're a small child. You can still learn, and that's our challenge for this week. We'll see you next week.